It is very interesting that in the earliest accounts in the Bible, as we've been going through, the humanity of man and the problem with man's humanity is portrayed over and over again. Now, we've been seeing how in picture God also portrayed how he was going to get mankind out of the mess. But as we go through and look at man's messes, we find some characteristics that have lots of parallels to our own situation. When we look in Genesis chapter 19, uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, it starts out with an introduction of how bad uh, the people of the city are. Now, in Genesis 13, verse 13, when Lot chose to head towards the valley that was facing Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the scripture says in Genesis 13, 13, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And yet we still find that uh, Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, then he was uh, living in Sodom, then he was the gate of Sodom, at the time that these two angels appearing in human form arrived in Sodom. Now we know the purpose of the angels according to uh, chapter 18. Uh, God is saying he's going to find out if the wickedness of Sodom has reached an extreme, and if it has, he's going to take some action. Of course, Abraham intercedes for his uh, nephew Lot and thought that he was successful in avoiding destruction. He thought there'd certainly be more than 10 uh, believing men, righteous men in that city. There were not. It was just Lot, his wife, and two daughters. And even the wife didn't make it quite all the way to safety uh, because of the looking back, as it says there in the passage. But when we get to these two men coming to the city and Lot shows hospitality, apart from all the problems of the uh, uh, situation in that city and what the men wanted to do, there is a very clear indication of how extreme they became. Because when Lot confronted them and said, wait a minute, this is not the right thing to do, guys. They responded by saying, this guy came in for a stopover, and now he's going to be our judge. Let's get rid of him. And to me, this is a very big illustration of what happens when people go to extremes. In this case, there was extreme immorality to the point where they could not tolerate anyone disagreeing with them. And that's kind of what happens with extreme views. Uh, you get so enamored with your rightness, your correctness, and you gather around people who agree with you, and then you meet up with someone who doesn't agree, and there must be something wrong with him or with them. Uh, you know what? If we could just eliminate this uh, judgmental person, this disagreeing person, we would be fine. Now, of course, that's not really the best way to deal with things. And yet when we look at extreme views in so many areas, whether it is religion or politics, socially, whatever, we find that people that go to extremes are also the ones who want to silence those who disagree. And uh, we can't be too sure that those who disagree with us are completely wrong. As I've said before, oftentimes you find the truth somewhere in between the extremes of an issue. And this is the situation that comes is that when you get to a point where you cannot tolerate disagreement, maybe you have to look at yourself and say, hmm, maybe I've gone to an extreme uh, in this area. Extremism, as we find in this passage, ultimately results in seeking to silence anyone who disagrees anyone who will not cooperate, anyone who won't go along with the crowd. And yet the vitality of so many societies has been because of the variety of opinions and views as shared together. There is a consensus that comes forth of what is best for the people, for the nation, or whatever. Now in this case, in Sodom, it didn't quite work out that way. There was no consensus, and uh, they brought upon themselves their own destruction. But Lot, as it says in the Second Peter, the righteous man, he was a man of faith but was 
very compromised in his living, God brought him out. His wife just could not stand leaving behind that life she had before, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, Lot was able to keep his back turned to where he came from, but he still bargained with the angels who said, run to the mountain, and uh, we're going to destroy the cities. He said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, I, I can't go to the mountain, I'll die. But there's, um, there's a, a little one here, a little city there. Let me go there. And that name of the city became Little, called Zoar. It was called Little because of Lot's intercession. And the angels, look, God is answering your request there. Go to the city, it's fine. Now, when he went to that city, all the other cities in that plain were destroyed. Uh, and even his wife, looking back and longing to be where she'd come from, she was destroyed. And Lot and his daughters enter the city, and they are safe. But Lot decides, I can't stay in this city. I'll die. And he runs to the mountain. <sighs> Crazy, compromised man. Uh, here he pleads to have this situation. God grants it. He gets that situation. He says, no, I don't think this is good. And he runs off somewhere else. So you have a man who had gone to a city of worldliness. He became a part of that city, but was rescued out of it. Thought he could not live without city life. But when he got back to city life, he decided, no, I can't live in city life. He goes out into the mountains. And the last picture we have of Lot is basically he's dwelling in emptiness. Very sad situation for a person to end up in, particularly one with such a heritage and so much potential. The nephew of Abraham, uh, the friend of God, uh, one who was a father of faith for so many. And yet uh, Lot could not bring himself to tear himself away from all the factors that were compromising until he ends up in an empty situation. He has no fruit to show. But you want to know how tremendously gracious God is? Through a very bad situation where his daughters decided they would cause him to be drunk and become impregnated by their own father because they felt there was no one. Else. They were living in emptiness. No one around. They said, no, one, no one's going to help us. And two nations came from that incest. Uh, we might not have chosen it that way, but there's a lot of things in the Bible that don't make sense the way we would choose it. And sometimes we have to look back and say, you know what? God, you are showing how amazingly gracious you are to a world that is lost in so many ways, so much sin and corruption, so much worldliness. You keep showing grace. God, you are amazing. And what do I mean by this? Well, one of the sons of Lot by his daughters is Moab. And when we get to Israel coming back into the land, when you get to the book of Judges, there is a woman from Moab who marries a man of Judah, Boaz and Ruth. From them come King David. From King David comes the Messiah. I don't always understand why God can bring good out of such a messy situation, a situation which we would never agree with to begin with, yet God brings grace through it all. I think we should learn, no matter how messy our situation is, we can look to God, trust Him, and we can see how God can be gracious and bring some amazingly good things out of what one time was a really messy situation. Well, my thoughts for today. Thanks for listening.